called Ultra Tuscan Orange Grapefruit. My God, America is imploding. Remember when I said during the break I was going to change that intro? Well, I haven't. So, uh, welcome. Welcome back to Fan Zone. Uh, this is the first episode back uh, after the break. Welcome. Uh, we had a great season last year. Uh, lots of fun things are coming this season that uh, we have yet to announce. Uh, but we're starting off the season with uh, a really good match that I'm hoping is going to be a really good match. We've got Rue and Jacoby coming back uh, to play another match. The last time we saw Rue um, was, I believe, at the end of the tournament. He made it pretty far in the tournament. I don't remember who he lost to. But was, it was it Kirk? It was, no, was it Kirk? I think it, yeah, that might yeah. have been Kirk when Kirk went on to play Jacoby then. And that was the last time we saw Jacoby, the former champion, uh, played Kirk at Mayhem at the Multiplex and uh, uh, lost the belt to Jacoby. But I believe it was on the final question. So it was a really, really close match. Uh, one of the best matches of last season for sure. Uh, arguably the best, in my opinion. So, um, Cody, you are back uh, on the uh, judges' seat for this one. How are you feeling about this one? Um, these two, well, my child's mad. Um, but the two things that I will say is if either one of these guys lose, they could just be like, fuck Tim Burkala because you put me up against Jacoby as my very first match back, or you put me up against Rue from a first match back, and I could have been playing an easy person. So at any point, they can be mad at you. Um, but I think they're both great. I think Rue showed up, uh, and challenged Kirk in the best way possible, and Jacoby lost his belt to Kirk, but that was not, uh, was a very close match, and I still uh, send Florence Pugh gifts to uh, Kirk pretty much daily, just because that is still the best way to get him really upset. <laughs> it's true. That was one of the best nights of my life. Was talking about uh, all <laughs> about Florence Pugh. Uh, that I believe Joe Jacoby got a book in the mail later that week. Uh, it was it was a really great it was a really great time. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so, um, no, but like you said, Rue, uh, yeah, did really well in that tournament. He beat Richard and Coho, uh, who had great matches in round one and two uh, to get to play Kirk. Uh, but, Boatman, you are here as well to judge this one today. How are you feeling about this matchup? I feel good. You know, uh, Jacoby and Rue are two people who we don't really get to see that often anymore. So I'm uh, glad they're here and competing uh, in this. So, yeah, I'm just... Happy to see both of them. Absolutely. So uh, we will first bring in uh, the lower-ranked uh, player, Rue. Rue, welcome back. Like I said, you beat Richard and then uh, Coho uh, to get to play Kirk and then lost to Kirk in the, I believe, the final semifinals? Or was it? It might have been the finals. Final. It was the final. It was of the, the final. Yeah, so um, went very far in last year, and now you're back uh, to play Jacoby. How are you feeling? Fuck you, Tim. It's fair. It's I fair. mean, I, I requested Jacoby. I just did not expect him to be my first match. But hey, we're here. Uh, I'm excited. Me and Jacoby, uh, we talk damn near every day. So being able to yell at each other, uh, it's going to be a fun time. Awesome. Great. Uh, well, we will then bring in the aforementioned Jacoby. Uh, Jacoby, welcome back. Uh you once held this belt. You took it from me, and then Kirk took it from you, and now you're back again. Um, what are your goals? You here to just have fun with Rue, or do you want to go smack the shit out of Kirk? I mean, like both is like always the always the always the goal here because I always have fun with Rue. I mean, like Rue is just so is a great guy, and he's fun to talk to. And I'm actually super. It's a weird mixture of being like super excited to you know debate with him because he is so jovial and fun and so knowledgeable too and cutthroat at the same time that it's just like I love his style and, and everything he does, and it's different than a lot of the other uh, competitors that I've faced. Uh, I'm also terrified, um, and but I also want to win a whole lot, um, and I'm super nervous. So it's like a whole lot of a lot of like a stew like just brewing in here of nerves and excitement and happiness and fear and all that fun stuff like normal that's fair all right well uh with all that being said we are gonna move into the match here's how it's gonna work uh we draft or the players drafted categories uh from both fans uh, fandom and warzone man i'm off to a great start uh we then wrote some questions based off of the categories they drafted uh they are going to debate those questions tonight there are four prep 
questions uh, that they are ready to debate. And then uh, if we end up tied after those four, we will go into a speed round. So the first person to three points uh, will be the winner. Uh, you guys will get a one minute opening. Uh, to your argument, followed by a five-minute free form, which will then be followed by a one-minute closing from each of the players. Uh, so, gentlemen, before we get into the first question, are there any questions from you guys? Why did you do this to us? Why? But no, no question. Yeah, why is the question? But yeah, we're good. We're good. Uh, because I like to have fun. Okay. And so because we requested it. it too. Like, I think we both requested it. I was like, I want to play play Rue and Ruth. I want to play Jacoby. And then now yeah. we're playing. We're like, shit, why are we playing each other? <laughs> so get over it. All right, let's do this. Do thing. this. All right, let's do this thing, starting off with the first question that I am excited for. Because something new came into fandom this year, into the category of YA, and it's Twilight. And so the first category drafted for fan zone of the year from Jacoby was in the category of YA, specifically Twilight. And the question is, what is the worst performance in a Twilight movie? Uh, my wife is really excited about this one, so please don't upset her. Uh, Jacoby, you drafted this one, so you're gonna get to start uh, first. Your I start your if I draft the question. Yes, oh. and then you get to go last on the way out. So got it. Uh, oh, okay, I knew that. I knew the rules. <laughs> so you have one minute to open your argument when you start talking. Taylor Lautner is the worst actor in the whole Twilight franchise with his worst performance coming in New Moon. This is the film where the main selling point of the franchise that makes it so popular is born. It's the love triangle between the awkward and uncomfortable Bella Swan, the cold and gothic Edward Cullen, and the renegade bad boy Jacob Black. Kristen Stewart and Robert Pattinson play those roles actually really well while the story and the script hurt their characters. Taylor Lautner just gives a bad performance in every single scene and you never, ever, ever believe for one single second that Lautner is the character he's supposed to be playing. He's creepy and bland when he's supposed to be a true friend to Bella. He's laughably wooden when he's supposed to be conflicted and full of rage and he's a whiny crybaby when he's supposed to be broken, tragic, and full of despair. And it all, all of that comes down to his lack of acting skills they were going to recast him for new moon and they didn't because he got abs and the entire movie suffers from this horrible performance he all sucks right. <laughs> okay <laughs> all right uh, all right <laughs> rue you now have one minute to open your argument when you start talking The original Twilight starts with a very monotone dialogue about Forks, Washington, and that gives you a preview of what you're going to get from Kristen Stewart the rest of the movie. A whole lot of stifled one-liners that are given in four versions of the same tone. She's sad. She sounds like she's reading lines. She's happy. She sounds like she's reading lines, just at a slightly louder tone. If she's mad, she's reading lines and pausing and breathing through every word. And if she's scared, she's pausing and breathing while her body convulses to convey that she's scared. None of what she says ever is ever believable. It seems like she's never rehearsed of it. So she's stumbling through everything and double down on it with horrible decisions the longer the movie goes through. Finishing with when Jake, when Edward sucks her blood, she has a combination of all four jumbled, unbelievable, laughable, scream, breath, body jumps. And the entire time she uses nothing that is in huh. any way believable. All right. This is really, I've already loved this. So, uh, guys, you have five minutes of free form. When one of you starts talking, please don't talk over each other. Or I will come and uh, yell at you. Really, really mean. Don't make me be mean. Have fun. 
Uh, okay, I'll start. Okay, I think there's a difference between a bad character and a bad performance. Bella Swan is a bad character. Everything that you said about her performance, about her being uncomfortable, monotoned, stumbling around, heaving and hoeing, is part of the character of Bella Swan. It's what makes her a poor character in that. It's the perfect viewpoint for this story that they're setting up, as opposed to someone like Jacob Black, who is supposed to be one thing. He's supposed to be badass. He's supposed to be conflicted. He's supposed to be all this stuff, and he doesn't do it. Kristen Stewart plays her part well. Taylor Lautner does not. Kristen Stewart doesn't actually play the part at all because she doesn't, she sounds like she doesn't know her lines. You can be uncomfortable. You can be awkward and you can be all of that by actually sounding like it, using facial expressions to, to convey that. She has to go to using the breathy words and the convulsions of her body because she doesn't know how to deliver lines. And in addition to that, half the movie, she's staring with an open mouth and, and then shakes her head and does things like that in order to convey something that she can't actually convey through words. Taylor, he's actually committed as if he knows what he wants to do and he uses some sort of form of emotion in his voice. Jacob is supposed to be an eager and awkward uh, uh, young kid who wants to go after Bella, but and all of that gives him boyish charm. He actually delivers that with sarcasm. He actually delivers that with some kind of emotion because he has to carry Kristen as she's so just not being able to deliver Anything you, you, you can't believe anything she's saying. All right. You, you say he knows what he wants to do. Yeah, no, he knows what he wants to do and then fails to do it. You keep referring to Kristen Stewart as breathy and, and can't really hold her emotions in order to do that. But like, look at these individual scenes that Kristen Stewart is actually in. Look at that uh, great scene at the end where she has to confront Charlie and tell him that, that she, that she's leaving. She switches the, the, the acting switches from being frantic and being unable to control and think and unsure of what to say to Charlie, you're a loser and I need to get out of here. It is the most heartbreaking moment in it and proves that her performance up to that point is a very crafted, very intentional thing to the character that she's playing. You say that Taylor Lautner is supposed to be awkward. No, he's not halfway through New Moon when he gets his abs and his wolf body and his thing. He's supposed to be badass. He's supposed to be a lot of things like conflicted or or, or worried about his destiny and or, or be a true friend to Bella. And he doesn't do literally any of that. He, every emotion that he's supposed to play, he comes across as the opposite while Kristen Stewart leans into the character that she is and and embraces it and just because it's poor writing around her character doesn't give her the bad performance no the writing carries every screen that she the, every scene that she's supposed to convey some emotion her yelling at charlie is at the same tone with that same awkward uh, uh awkward as she does when she tries to show some type of emotion in terms of figuring out what's going on with uh, her friends at the beginning, figuring out what's uh, going on in terms of learning that she's a vampire. It all sounds exactly the same. The, that same one goes through at the end when she's looking at, uh, at Edward at, at the end and saying he's going to leave. And it's that same type of tone where she doesn't know what she's saying. Jacob has the boyish charm before he changes. You see the sarcasm, you see the, the, the want to be there with her, you see the anger and he actually commits to it. And after that, he turns into the, while it's not good, it's way better than what Kristen Stewart is doing in terms of being able to actually convey any emotion whatsoever. You know when he's angry, you know when he's sad, you know when he's conflicted. You don't know the difference when Kristen Stewart comes forward with that. No, so so I want to start off because you said you mentioned that final scene. I also think the final scene of the first Twilight movie is actually really great for Kristen Stewart because she conveys so much. She's full of yearning, she's full of angst, and she's full of heartbreak um, through the decision of Edward not turning her into a vampire. It proves that she is a good actress. You say that Edward, uh, you say sorry, you say that Jacob shifts uh, part way through it, but it's not true. One of his um, one of his first lines to to uh, to Bella is like, "Well, I'm just filling out, Bella. You would know that if we were hung out more." That line is meant to be seductive supposed to be sexy but it comes across as cringe and that's indicative of every single line that he gives throughout it you keep saying the breathiness of of kristen stewart is what hinders her but that's the emotion of someone who is trapped and uncomfortable in her own skin and needs to eventually become a vampire jacob is supposed to be a werewolf and doesn't play into that at all in his performance it's not supposed to be sexy and it's not supposed to be provocative it's supposed to be somebody who's it's such a love triangle 
Sorry. The love triangle doesn't get go into in, in into until eclipse and doesn't go into the at the end. What? The love triangle doesn't really hit until then. It's there. He's trying to figure out what he's wanted to be a, uh, as a werewolf. It's trying to uh, to figure out ways to tell what Bella's doing. The end scene that Bella's has with Edward is exactly the same as the one with Charlie. Time. All right, Rue, we are going to start with you for your closing argument. You have one minute when you start talking. Throughout the entirety of the movie, Kristen Stewart sounds exactly the same when she's conveying anger, when she's conveying sadness, when she's conveying happiness, when she's conveying all of that. Because it's so surrounded by the same weird movements and breathiness that just make everything she's trying to be convoluted and jolted. You don't know. She sounds exactly the same trying to go through that when she's figuring out why Edward is, is holding his breath. When she, that when she's doing that and trying to convince him to not leave and turn into a vampire, it all sounds the same. It all sounds like she's stumbling over words. What Taylor Lautner is doing in New Moon is actually trying to commit to a role of being before the change, an awkward boy who wants to be a, a, a little boyish and, and try to follow along. And then afterwards, trying to go through, oh, I'm going through some stuff right now. I'm going to act like I'm angry. I'm going to then try to bring you in with me to do that. And while it's not great, he at least has a difference between angry, mad and sad, while Kristen Stewart is the same tone throughout the entire film. All right, we will bring in Jacoby. Jacoby, you have one minute to close your argument when you start talking. Bella Swan sounds exactly the same because that's the character, and that's what she's asked to do. Taylor Lautner is asked to do five major things in New Moon. One, he's supposed to act like a true friend to Bella in her time of need, but he's not, and you're left wondering why Bella would be best friends with this block of wood. Two, he's supposed to feel conflicted and torn about his upcoming wolf change and tribe loyalty, but he just acts like constipated during these sequences. Three, he's supposed to transform into this badass werewolf who bottles up his rage and fury to act as the bad boy counterpart point to Edward, but I've seen soft, fluffy pillows with more menace than Lautner. Four, he's supposed to be a broken down mess at the end when Bella chooses Edward, but the CGI wolf he turns into acts more sad than Lautner does in that scene. And five, you know, he's supposed to have abs, and that one he does have, but abs do not save him from having the worst performance in the worst movie in the Twilight franchise. Everything he's asked to do fails, while Kristen Stewart plays, leans into the character, and plays it well. Time. All righty. Let's bring in... That's the wrong judge. We'll bring in that one. That one. And then them. Um... Before we uh, get into this, uh, Maggie, what do you think of the arguments? Nodding, yeah. Jacoby said New Moon is the worst movie. Do you agree? What's the worst one? Breaking Dawn Part 1? Yeah, that's fair. Um, do we have our votes? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to go with Jacob E. Um Jacoby, um, I thought that Amaru's opening and like the first bit of the freeform uh, was going well, but every time he brought up like an example of Kristen Stewart's like rough acting, I thought Jacoby did a really good job of explaining no why these were actually like great moments and the, and the differences in the performance, whereas everything that's supposed to be coming from Taylor Lautner is absolute garbage and isn't working, and I didn't hear much rebuttal um, from Amaru that really worked for me. So I went with Jacoby. Uh, Cody, where are you going and why? New season, you always go first. You go maniac. Jacoby, um, I will say for the fact, um, New Moon is by... F that's when the love triangle started. When he tried to throw out that it doesn't really start there. No, it 100% does. Um, and it was... They're both really bad in that series, I would say. I would say uh, Taylor Lautner is far and away probably the worst. But I think I think Jacoby did a better job of countering everything with Kristen Stewart and trying to show some range of emotion that she does throw throughout the series. But, uh, yeah, there's no redeeming quality, and, and Jacoby pretty much proved that for Taylor. So, yeah. All right. Jacoby gets the uh, point. Boatman. I also would have said Jacoby. I just think he kept jackhammering home the point of bad character, not bad performance. And I think that really helped Jacoby. Okay. 
So Jacoby gets the first point. Um, <laughs> we're going to move on to question number two. Uh, this was drafted by Rue. It is in the category of crime, specifically the Oceans trilogy. And the question is, which Oceans member should have a spinoff movie? So, Rue, you were going to start this one since you drafted it. You get one minute to open your argument when you start talking. The Ocean's Trilogy charm has always been about the characters, the journey, and the twists and turns, and the unraveling, uh, unraveling of that journey, no matter where uh, the destination is seen or not. The charm is probable from every character, and it's so much fun either being su surprised about how the caper got done or trying to solve how things get done before they revealed. And for a spinoff, uh, for a character, that charm and that vibe has to carry through while still giving you a character uh, give me a character with enough reason to stick mostly with them uh, instead of the entire crew. And only one character has that amount of intrigue, that amount of mystery to them that you want to not only solve the caper that they're pulling off, but you also want to solve the onion that is the character themselves. And the only person in the entire crew that has that much mystery to themselves and can bring so much charm and joy to the caper is the amazing Yen. You can see the rest of my time. All right. We will move over to Jacoby. You now have one minute to open your argument when you start talking. One of Ruben's first lines in Ocean's Eleven is, I know more about casino security than any man alive. I invented it. Now, don't you kind of want to find out what he means? Business kingpin and old school casino tycoon Ruben is the best option for a spinoff movie. He cackles with energy, charisma, and flair in a way that's similar to Saul Goodman in Breaking Bad, making him endlessly watchable. And he has such a rich history that's tied directly to both the criminal underworld and old school Las Vegas, which is never really commented on. How does Ruben, who rubs elbows with Las Vegas elites and opens a bunch of casinos, also have all this knowledge and ties to mass? Master Thieves and Criminals, that's the story that needs to be told. The best spinoffs take characters you love, fleshes them out in ways you didn't expect, and does something different while still retaining the original spirit. That's what you get from a Ruben spinoff. He's the character that best captures the energy and the fun from the original trilogy, but can tell a brand new, equally compelling story that can stand on its own. Time. All right. Five minute freeform. When one of you starts talking. Have fun. We've been in Vegas for the entirety of the trilogy, for two out of the three trilogies. We do not need to go back to Casino. We do not need to see, uh, seek what, if you're going to go through a prequel, we already know everything we need to know for the most part about Ruben. We, what you want from a character is character you don't know about. Behind Danny, Rusty, and Linus, we know the most about Ruben. We know how he's fought against the other casino um, uh, moguls in 11, and we've seen him try to fight to come back in 13. And anything that you're going to do with him has to revolve around what we've been around the entirety of the time. When it comes to Yen, from movie one to three, he is damn near different every time, and that fits the character because he's such a mystery. Um, and that makes you want to dig deeper into his story and allows you to go so many different places. Not only there, but on a practical level, he can have stunts in his films to create set pieces. His non-English can create great comedy and mystery. And Ken Xiaobo's full commitment to every aspect of that character shows how naturally and charming every new iteration of Yen has been. That's where we want to go. That's who we want to know about. I vehemently disagree with you that Las Vegas, we need to get out of Las Vegas. I think Vegas is vital to, to the Oceans franchise. It was great in Oceans 11. The, we didn't go there in Oceans 12 and it was bad. And we returned there for a great adventure in Oceans 13. And that's why my spinoff movie is going to be great. Because my spinoff movie isn't about a big heist. You keep saying we can't just rob Vegas again. Exactly. I'm not interested in another heist movie. That's what the Ocean movies are for. I want a movie that delves into crime overall in Las Vegas. Centered around Ruben. Because, because that ties into the themes and general ideas that the original that the original trilogy did but also does something different with it and tells a new story that can stand on its own you talk about the amazing yen having another heist with doing another with with more capers more acrobatics more everything but that doesn't like that's just watch oceans 11 watch oceans 13 watch oceans 8 you get all of that there his story he's a bland character he is part of an acrobatics team where okay what else? That's that's it. Ruben has such a mysterious air around him that you want to know how he got to the way he was. I know how Yen became it. He was good at acrobatics. 
From movie one to three, he goes from just the acrobatic character to somebody who has a lot, who has women by his side in a in a uh, in a mansion. And you're like, how in the world did he get that? And we have no idea because he, we don't know what he's saying. We know nothing about him. What I'm saying about Yen is, if you want to go back to a caper, you can go back to a caper. But the fact that he can do stunts, that he's different from one to two to three, and you have no knowledge of why he's different, that means you can go to any type of crime. You can go to Vegas if you want to keep the Vegas. Vegas vibe. You can go back to China if you want to go to Chinese vibes and see what he's doing there. You can go to the million different places that he may have been because we don't know where he is. And because you can build any type of story you want around that character, you can make a crime caper that follows the mystery and follows that onion. But also he is more charismatic and more um, able to do action and comedy because of the fact that we know little to nothing about him. Ruben, you can't. Ruben, you you're stuck with what Ruben is. Yeah, and what Ruben's is is fascinating. How did he become the person that he is today? He's an old school Las Vegas tycoon living in a new age Vegas. It, does he reflect on how he got to where he was today and what are the steps he had to do to get there? How does his criminal life overlap with his legitimate stuff? These are interesting takes to take. You're you're projecting a blank slate on a mate. You're calling Amazing Yen both really like compelling and interesting and all these things, but also that he's super blank and you can craft any story around him. Yes, you know who Ruben is because he's an interesting character, because he steals it because he's the heart of oceans 13 that has it you can so you know that he's capable of crafting a story around yen is a great supporting character when you need someone to do a flip or something like that that's it ruben actually has weight to carry an entire movie one minute that, ruben might has weight to carry an entire movie and we've done that already he he carried the movie of 13 we've seen him do that in 11 when it comes to yen yen is the one you actually want to know about you want to see why in the world is he completely different character from the original why in the world is he different from 12 to 13 and being able to build around that allows you to focus not only on just a story and a, a crime, either a crime caper or whatever he's doing and solve the mystery of that. But you can also start solving the mystery of the onion. And that's what Oceans is about, solving those mysteries. We already know Ruben. We know what he's like. We know how we, we know what it's like for him to battle moguls. We know what it's like to, to fight in casinos because we've seen that in both of those. We don't want to see that again. And if we do that, we're not we're not going into the character. We're just going into the crime. Yes, and that's why showing Ruben a battle back in old school Las Vegas when the birth of crime in Las Vegas was born makes it an interesting parallel to the original right. Ocean's Trilogy. All right, Jacoby, we're going to start with you for your closing. You have one minute when you start talking. Yes, I agree. Ruben's life in both Ocean's 11 and Ocean's 13 isn't necessarily great. He's betrayed by two business partners and almost dies. I think the third film did really weaken Ruben's legacy, but the spin-off film could redeem him. I think Ruben deserves one last story where maybe he's uh close to actual death but wants to try to secure maybe one last deal while reflecting on his past during the birth of Las Vegas and his criminal origins. Was Ruben always like this or did he forge this flamboyant personality to stand out? while making a name for, him, for himself. That's an interesting question that sets up a new story that also fits with the tone of the Oceans movies, which is important. The Amazing Yen is a one-note character, and his spin-off movie would just be a rehash of Oceans 11 plot lines with doing another caper or something like that, while Ruben's spin-off is about crime overall and follows a character who's actually super complicated uh, navigate the tricky line between business and crime. It's like Ocean's Eleven meets Casino meets Better Call Saul, and that's a perfect spinoff film for the Ocean's franchise. Time. All right, Rue, you now have one minute to close your argument when you start talking. The vibe of Oceans and the Oceans franchise is all built around the fact that you want to solve a crime with somebody. You want to go in there and figure out what are they doing, how are they doing it, and you're building off that. And at the same time, you want to learn more about the characters. And there's no more character, more intriguing, more mysterious, and more, wait a second, how did he go from here to here to here, then the amazing Yen? He is the one that he comes with the most comedy by not, by you can play with whether or not 
uh, you want him to uh, have a translator, or you can break the fourth wall and let him have captions uh, when he's talking to you. There's so many different things you can do with Yen that allows you to build a, a mystery on both the character and him. When it comes to Ruben, you, we know Ruben. We know what he's like. You're not you're not going to be able to follow that same vibe because we're going to move into more of the crime thrillers like Goodfellas, like Casinos. It's not going to carry the same thing as an Ocean's Trilogy because we're not going to be, if you want to go through how he came up, we're not going to go through that mystery. We're not going to go through that caper, which is o what an Ocean's is about. All right. Bring in the judges. Ugh. I, I do myself a disservice by having only seen all three of these movies twice. Uh, it's it's a crime, I know. Hey, no pun intended. Um, um, yeah, Maggie and I just watched the trilogy like a year ago. If you had never seen them before. So good. The, the, I, hey, man, I really like the third one. <laughs> I think the third one's really good. Um, okay, Boatman. I've heard that uh, you enjoy these films a little bit. I really enjoy these films. Uh, yeah. The third one is Home Alone in a Casino, and I love it. Uh, uh, yeah, go. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I said Jacoby for this one. I think the thing that really gave him the edge for me, like last time, the thing that gave Jacoby the edge was his defense. I think this time his offense, specifically his uh, point about Yen, basically Maru saying that Yen was – both like a clean slate and yet this interesting character and Jacoby kind of taking that down of like that doesn't make sense. So I think that really worked in Jacoby's favor. Uh, I also went with JB. Um, I thought that both were ideas that I would be interested in seeing um, of a, a for a movie, but I thought that uh, Jacoby's uh, the thing that kind of like helped me early on with Jacoby was when Amaru was like, uh, we already, we've done Vegas already. And Jacoby was like, that's like the best thing. Like that's, we want to see the origins of that and everything. I thought that just overall the pitch worked better. And it, like Boatman said, his offense uh, was, was pretty strong. So I went with Jacoby. Uh, Cody, where did you vote and why? I went with J. Oh, the Y fell off. It was Jacoby, um, the last letter. Um, but um, what I will say is uh, I've never seen somebody start with, like, the openings are always some people just throw around. He went for the fucking throat out of the gate for Ruben and said everything that needed to be said. Regret every decision for signing up on that post or wanting to play. Jacoby is back for blood and wants to win this belt, and you can see it clear as day. Um, I think Amara did great. But the problem was, I think two people read the question two different ways. He made it a heist film again, and he just said, I want another character. And honestly, the character just worked in that way where he can break it down. I think Amaro did really good, but his main counterpoints, we know all about Ruben. And I, Jacoby just basically broke out like, we don't know everything about Ruben, and I want to find out. So it was very close, but overall, I think Jacoby just uh, set the groundwork, and it was a hard fight to come back. But Amaro made it close. Yeah. All right, so Jacoby's up 2-0. Uh, Rue does need to hit this next question in order to stay in the game. Uh, the question is from the category of action adventure. The question is, what action movie should never be remade? Uh, lots of options we could have chosen here on this one. So, uh, Jacoby, you're going to get to start on this one. You have one minute when you start talking. Raiders of the Lost Ark is a monumental action-adventure film that truly should never be remade. Yes, it's not the first film of its kind, and there have been countless films since then that have copied Raiders' formula, style, and tone, and yet none of them are Raiders as much as they'd like to be. The impact Raiders has had on cinema as an individual movie is insane. Everyone knows who Indiana Jones is, and it's Harrison Ford. Remaking Raiders is like remaking Casablanca or Citizen Kane or The Godfather. It feels wrong. There is no combination of writer, director, actor who could successfully remake Raiders as a hit, and Disney is much better off making spin-off movies set in the same universe rather than just flat-out remaking Raiders because it can't be done. The backlash to remaking Raiders would break the internet and nothing would top the original. In a time where, we're, where we 
we are rebooting absolutely everything. That special, you know, nexus point of cinema that is Raiders of the Lost Ark. That is the film that they should not and cannot touch for its impact and for its uh, just its place in the history of cinema. All right. Um, Rue, you now have one minute to open your argument when you start talking. Jacoby said it. There are plenty of iconic action movies that shouldn't be remade. They're perfect as they are. The action sets are exciting. The characters are iconic. The stories are riveting. And no one can live up to the original actors. Uh, so there's no need to retread those stories. If you're going to do that, go back and watch the original. So when you're trying to figure out an action, uh, iconic action movie that is more untouchable than another, what makes that more untouchable than another? And Kill Bill is the answer. And the reason Kill Bill is the answer is because the story is so unique to the characters and the essence of the film itself that, that if the narrative is reworked in any way, shape, or form, you don't have Kill Bill anymore. You can't not go after and eventually kill Bill. You can't not have Beatrix be a bride. She has to fight the Deadly Viper assassination squad with the Hitori Hanzo sword. We need it to be Tarantino's story, and making changes to that story makes it not kill Bill. So the only way to do it is retread the same story points with different actors, and if you're going to do that, just go watch the original. Time. Whoo, boy. This is going to be a good one. All right, guys. Five minutes when one of you starts talking. I think the problem that 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 you're not addressing is the fact that Kill Bill is a revenge story overall. The story, the narrative itself that it's telling can easily be remade. And I would argue that there are great examples of ways that you can remake Kill Bill to make it a still interesting story. Uh, like if you have Gareth Evans who directed, you know, the Raid Redemption, what does his version of Kill Bill look like? What is someone who made like the John Wick and the Atomic Blonde movies? What do their versions of Kill Bill look like? The problem with your movie is that its story is simple. It is straightforward. It is a revenge story about killing bill and anybody can add their distinct flair to it heck if there's get an actual martial arts and samurai filmmaker to remake kill bill and then instead of just a love letter to kill bill you uh to samurai films and martial arts you have an actual samurai uh film and martial arts where raiders is this perfect untouchable thing that should not be remade you just said it revenge is so simple and yes revenge is so simple that's why all these revenge films are made gareth edwards is gonna make raid who um um uh What's his face? We made John Wick. He's going to make John Wick. You cannot go and put a samurai in there and call it Kill Bill. It's another revenge story because revenge stories come out one by one by one by one and they make their own movies. Yes, revenge is simple, but that story is unique. And any of those movies you say you're going to make, it's not Kill Bill anymore. It's whatever revenge story they want to do. When it comes to Raiders, you said it. You said it. They, they, there have been indie knockoffs. We both love The Mummy. We love The Mummy 99. And the fact that we love it shows that people might want to go back to those type of stories. And yes, while it's blasphemous to go after stuff like Kill Bill, there's so many sci-fi and mythical elements to uh, Raiders that you actually can change the trajectory of how you get to the Ark. The Ark doesn't have to be in Tannis and De Doug. You, it doesn't have to melt people's faces. What it can do is it can corrupt them and then make you a deadlier antagonist to continue the story. Marion doesn't have to be kidnapped. Marion can actually save Indy or Salah and it's still Raiders of the Lost Ark. You can't, can't change Kill Bill at all. You can change Raiders a little bit and maybe see what happens. You're changing the whole movie around. It's like, yeah, you can, you can remake Indiana Jones if you you can change anything then, then it's not a remake that that is a version of the mummy the movie that we both love so it's not remaking i'm talking about actual remaking of the film and the difference is my uh, you cannot remake raiders of the lost ark because you can't cast in somebody else's indiana jones you can't capture the magic spielberg dig but with kill bill you can remake that because the core of the story remains the same and it's the stylistic components around the movie that makes it uh that makes it a tarantino film but i want to see somebody else's take on the movie in order to do it because those are interesting stories again tarantino is 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 not a is not a martial arts director. He loves martial arts movies. Let, get an actual martial arts movie in to, uh, to make a Kill Bill movie, and you have one of the best action movies of all time. You can't do that with uh, with with Raiders of the Lost Ark. You can't just slot somebody in there. And if you start remaking the story, then you're just making a different movie, and th that you easily can made because they've done it before in a movie we both love called The Mummy. So you can't remake Raiders as the way it is, but you can remake Kill Bill the way it is. You're talking about the core of the story can change. 
the outcome of the story of Kill Bill is she needs to go kill Bill. It is Beatrix who has to kill Bill because she was the one who made him uh, unhappy and she was a part of the deadly Viper, Viper assassination squad. You say change the martial arts. If you change the martial arts, you're changing the action scene, but not changing the story. Different action scenes with the same story is still Kill Bill. And it's like, wait a second. Why are we doing that if we already have Kill Bill? The core of Raiders is Indiana Jones needs to go find the Ark before somebody else does. There isn't a specific way he has to do it. There aren't specific characters he has to meet except for Salah and Marion. And Marion can, Marion how she is, she can change. Salah how he is, he can change. You can update those modern aspects because they're not real life and there's not a specific way it has to go. One Kill minute. Bill has to go a specific way or it's just a different martial arts movie finding a different person to kill. Yes, it's on because the Kill Bill is a style movie. It's a stylistic movie. Style is the key and driving force behind Kill Bill. And that's the part that can be replicated by every other person. The heart of Indiana Jones, the magic of Indiana Jones comes in things like Harrison Ford's performance. What? Like if you remake it nowadays, Chris Pratt's playing Indiana Jones. Does that make you happy? No, that makes nobody happy. Nobody could step into those shoes where you say Beatrix needs to kill Bill. Yes, that's a story you can easily remake. You can, uh, Anybody can be Beatrix as she... And anyone can be Bill and make something fascinating out of that. But nobody can become Indiana Jones or Marion or Sala for everything like that because the movie itself is so special and holds such a special place in everybody's heart and in cinema history overall. There are nobody saying like, oh, you you mentioned earlier, like it's blasphemous to, to, to remake Kill Bill. Nobody is saying that. People are saying that about Indiana Jones. People accept it all right. to Aaron Reich. What? Oh, okay. Well, sure. I didn't know that. Uh, sorry. I'm not supposed to say anything. Uh, this was Jacoby. So, Rue, you are going first with your closing one minute when you start talking. A key point he said was that nobody can replace Heron for Harrison Ford. And everybody said that about Solo. And we saw Solo and we said, you know what? This newcomer, Alden Ehrenreich... You know what? He's not Harrison, and he shouldn't have been Harrison. He took the vibe and made it his own. I like that. And you can bring in a newcomer to make a new indie. Everything he's talking about, that it's style that you, you can remake, you can't hit Tarantino style. You can only hope to, to, to live up to it. But the thing about Kill Bill is whether you try to emulate the style, where you try to change the characters, while you try to change um, some of the style around it, the story is the story, and the story is Kill Bill. And if you try to change that in any way, it's no longer Kill Bill. Everything else around it is going to just try to be a fake remake. And you're like, nah, this isn't Kill Bill. Let me just go watch that and take this at its own. When it comes to Raiders, there's so more sci-fi elements that can be modernized. There's so many story elements that can go different types of ways that you don't have to follow the same a path to get to the arc. You can change Raiders and Time. maybe it's acceptable. All right. Jacoby, you have one minute when you start talking. Uh, if Raiders of the Lost Ark were made today, it would probably star Tom Holland, uh, Chris Pratt, or even like Dwayne Johnson and be directed by, you know, the guy who did Jumanji or, or Jean Colette Serra who did Jungle Cruise. Would it be bad? Yes. And that's because the original film is a landmark in cinema where Kill Bill is not. Uh, Raiders should not and cannot be remade. It's why they're adamant about trotting out a hundred year old Harrison Ford for the upcoming sequel, even though he keeps breaking more parts of his body because they know they just can't reboot it. It's one of the only characters in cinema that you can't recast because of its impact. Rue spent most of his closing talking about Solo. I think Solo is a completely different character than Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones is Harrison Ford. Kill Bill should absolutely be remade because it would be fascinating to see what another director with a different style would do with this different bloody revenge story. Rue says like, oh yeah, if you change every element of Raiders, then you can remake Raiders. But we're not talking about that. We're remaking these original films. And it's much easier to do that with Kill Bill Volume 1 because it's mostly a style over substance thing than it is with Raiders, which is not time all right uh, a couple housekeeping things uh saying that kill bill is not a landmark in cinema in front of cody newberry interesting strategy um also uh to say that everybody in cinema uh loves indiana jones my wife kind of cackled a little bit she's not a fan uh it's a it's a it's a weird part in our marriage that i have to live on with uh yes. but Hey, and she saw Raiders for the first time in the theater. Yes, it was. Oh, you just hate short round. Uh, okay, so uh, 
Okay. <laughs> so, no time for love, Dr. Jones. <laughs> no time for love, Dr. Jones. I just watched the movie. Potato. Okay. Uh, sorry. Enough rambling. Oh, also, I just want to clear the air. Amaru said uh, Alden Ehrenreich, and for some reason, my brain heard Ansel Elgort. <laughs> <laughs> and so I straight up was like, what the fuck is he talking about? And then when he said solo, I was like, oh. It's the first time you've ever tried to stop a person from going down a massive slope. To I was seriously the- like, what are you saying? And then I realized... Army okay. him. It, it made uh, a lot more sense when he got to do things. So anyway, Cody, you get to go first on this one. So this was a really weird fight. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying anything against both of you guys, because I think top tier, absolutely top tier. It just seems like we were circling some weird ground. Like, what we're going to remake, is there going to be things changed, stylistic, this, blah, blah, blah. So I had to like kind of rip a bunch of stuff away and like kind of get where you guys were both coming for. And that ended up with uh, Rue for me. And the fact of what was Rue, I think Jacoby kind of helped it a little bit with like, here's a stylistic, here's is this. And I think how he says it's like a direct plan. And if you don't do it the way that Tarantino did it, then watch a different movie. Like there was a lot of thing in your, I think kind of hurt because I, my opposite choice don't ever remake Raiders. I think that's the correct choice, honestly, of those. But it was sort of hard in that one because you're like, there's other sequels to it. There's other things he kept bringing up. There's other people that could. And even when you're pitching other people like Tom Holland and Chris Pratt, I'm like, that's something Hollywood probably would do. Didn't 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 the argument, but I'm like, you have a shot on that one. So um, it was really close, but I don't. I think it was wasn't fought the way it was, the question was intended. I think, and that was what threw the weirdness off. I think if we started with the opening, Jacoby would have won. But yeah, I went with Haru. All right, so Boatman, you're going next. Uh, I also went with Haru. I think the the thing that really kind of gave her the edge was uh, basically the way that he described different changes you could make to Raiders to make it still be Raiders, but also still work. And I think that was really what helped his argument. It really painted more of like a vivid picture of what a good Raiders remake could look like. So uh, that's where I gave Rue the edge. Yeah, I also went with Rue. Um, clean sweep for him. Um, I agree with Boltman and Cody, but uh, specifically what Boltman said, what kind of did it for me, was the um, Rue pointed out things like, yes, you can have, like, you, he's got to do this and this and this, but these are the things you could do to make it different. You can't change things in Kill Bill and then why do it at all? So I thought Jacoby fought it really well, but I thought Rue's argument overall worked uh, better um, for what was being argued. So uh, Rue staying alive, going to the final prep question which was drafted by rue oh it's my favorite category it's middle earth we're talking about middle earth today uh the question is what is the coolest moment in the hobbit trilogy the hobbit trilogy i went with the hobbit that's you know you don't hear that a lot from tim uh so rue you get to start this one off you got one minute when you start talking The Hobbit movies never needed to be a trilogy. The studio wanted to bank off of Lord of the Rings success and stretch it one book over three films by mostly adding overlong and overbloated set pieces that were meant to look cool, but either either added nothing to the movies or the franchise or were so over the top and far-fetched that it missed the cool mark by a lot. However, in Battle of the Five Armies, one moment that did not miss that mark, not only because it has badass dialogue, incredible tension, the best action of the series, Howard Shore's awe-inducing score accompanied by perfect sound effects, not only does it do that, but it also reaches back to the original trilogy and lean on the strengths of brilliant characters to build them up more and let audience and fans see more of what we wanted to see from them that we never got in Lord of the Rings. The only moment in the entirety of The Hobbit that is cool as hell when we're watching it and cool because it gives us what we wanted from the original is when the White Council comes to Galadriel's aid at Dol Guldur. Time. All right. Jacoby, we will move over to you for your one-minute opening when you start talking. 
Uh, Bard killing Smog is the coolest moment in the Hobbit trilogy. Just look at the way the scene is structured and you'll find a bunch of little cool moments piling on top of each other leading to a really epically cool conclusion. Watching Smog soar through the air, raining fire everywhere, cool. Watching Bard climb the bell tower and stand upon the wreckage of his town knowing the odds are insurmountable, cool. Watching the small way that he grabs his arrows from his quiver, cool. The point is... Everything about this sequence is cool, and as we watch Bard not give up as his arrows bounce off Smog, only for his son to come in clutch with that special spear, and then seeing how Bard's quick thinking finds a way to shoot the dragon, oh my god, that's awesome. It's like icing on the cool cake to see the final shot of Smog watching the life drain from his face and then tumbles down to earth. The point is, everything about this sequence is cool, and it represents how cool the Hobbit trilogy should have been, and there should have been more moments that were more like this. This, uh, other than you know, more nostalgia filled moments. All right, these are two cool scenes. Let's see which one works better, guys. Five minutes free form. When one of you starts talking, you want to experience cool. Let me set the scene Galadriel is holding Gandalf's broken body, and the uh, coolest villains of the trilogy, the Ring Wraiths, who are now in a brand new cool iteration as apparitions tells her. You are now alone. You are alone in the darkness. And she replies, I am not alone. And you're like, oh shit, who's coming? I, are they coming? And they come. Elrond comes out in his gold suit, uh, 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 sword in hand. And then next to him, cool, calm, and collected, like it's a day in the park, is Christopher Lee as Saruman saying, are you in need of assistance, my lady? And you're like, oh shit, really? And then the ring race actually turn around and say, Oh shit, really? And go slow on him, accompanied with booming sound effects. And then right after that, the absolutely most badass line in the entire trilogy, Elrond says, you should have stayed dead and starts whooping ass with one hand. That is the absolutely coolest thing. And right now, whoever's in the back, you need to hit the oh meme because that's exactly what we felt in the theaters. Okay, uh, see, you and I view that scene very differently because one, I think your scene is too stoked in nostalgia sake stuff. It's cool because you have connection to all these characters from the previous movies and it's not a cool moment from the Hobbit trilogy. It's cool from knowing Lord of the Rings movies beforehand. And you and I view that scene very differently too because actually it's kind of a really boring fight. There might be some cool lines to it, but it's tough because that scene is incredibly hard to watch visually. The editing is choppy. The lighting is dark. The stunt devils are, it's, are hiding their faces so it just hair in the faces to show that it's not Christopher Lee swinging that staff around and the CGI ghosts are worse than the ghosts in Return of the King and I think that overall hurts your moment whereas my moment, Bard taking down the dragon that's decimating his thing, being the one sole hero to stand against this mighty evil and taking it down with one last shot, it trumps your moment, absolutely it does, because it doesn't have the problems that yours has, yours is good for fans of the, you know uh, the, who liked the character from the other one, but it doesn't stand on a moment as its own. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a problem of yours. In the one minute that this action scene goes up, the camera is above Elrond as he does his one-handed style. The camera is above Saruman as he does his two-handed style to show juxtaposition. Then compare that to the new apparitions that are teleporting and then getting hit and then going off the cliff and climbing back up. The action sequence itself with the badass dialogue of that single line, which is absolutely amazing from Elrond because Elrond used to be old and wise. And now he's coming up like, oh, oh, I'm that dude you need to fuck with right now. Everything about the scene, whether you know it beforehand because of what you see and what you hear and because of what you know, Lord of the Rings, um, to bring that about makes it cool. Your scene has cool, your moment has cool things piled upon it, but your moment is emotional and heartfelt. And you know what I don't think about when I think about cool? I think about emotional and heartfelt because it's about him connecting with his son. It's about him telling him to stay. And you feel the emotion in the heart as they connect. That's the first emotion. The second emotion, you mentioned it. Small comes in shooting fire from the jump. Then why does his stupid ass talk a line and line after line as he sees that the arrow was coming from him? Stupid. Okay, yeah, yeah, come to me. So uh, I, I'm confused on your, on your argument here because you go and talk about why it's so emotional, why it's so awesome to see Elrond come in with the sword. And then you say, oh, your scene's too emotional. Your whole scene is based on emotion. Emotion from the past characters. And emotion can still be cool, you heartless bastard. It can be cool. Seeing Bard being, knowing that he's probably going to die on that rooftop, having to face the dragon that's killed almost everyone he loves, having his son be there. Um, the, the really cool moment there is when he's about to shoot it, when he doesn't see see that there's that that hole in the dragon's 
scale thing. So he's just going to fire that hoping. And then he gets that moment, that glint, that that he can take Smog down. And that is the moment where everything changes. Where hell, We're like, hell yeah, I'm going to kill this motherfucking dragon. And it's just awesome. It's cool. It's out there. Where And it, it, it's, it's a moment that works on its own. And who cares if it has emotion to it? Your moment has emotion to it because Gandalf is sitting there all week. and One minute. And like, uh, why are we why help me like do this do this sort of thing there's emotion baked in these things just because it's motion doesn't make it cool and uh, i think my scene is overall cooler as an individual moment and as a story moment the only moment that gandalf's in it is for half a second out of the entire minute the any emotion you say you feel from feeling them characters uh, and seeing them from behind is not about relationships. It's about the fact that we've never seen Elrond fight, that we've never seen Saruman fight, and we actually see them be cool and badass now. That's what we don't know about those characters. We now get to see that. So the emotion you're talking about pulling from is cool emotion about action and badassness. It's not about a relationship. The relationship between Bard and his son is what makes emotion in that scene. And I don't think heartfelt when I think cool. And I also don't think stupid when I think cool because the entire time I'm like, why is Smaug just talking? Just flame his ass. I don't think stupid, cool. I think stupid and emotional. Time. All right. Rue, or no, uh, sorry, Jacoby, you are closing first on this one. You have one minute when you start talking. Don't start my clock yet. Is well, it took a lot out of me. I am obviously not a big Lord of the Rings fan, but I think that actually helps me answer this question. I think objectively, the coolest moment is Bard killing Smog. It's a bunch of little cool moments leading to a dramatically cool conclusion. Everything about that sequence is cool. You could show that to everyone, and it might get them to watch more Lord of the Rings films if they never have, because it's just really cool to look at. Rue's scene is cool, but it relies way too much on nostalgia and love for the previous movies. Strip away your knowledge of the characters, and you have poorly you know, choreographed, darkly lit uh bad cgi rendered scenes of old dude stunt devils fighting ps2 level of uh, video game effects it's choppy and not fun to look at besides the nostalgia factor while my scene is a visual highlight it's filled with a bunch of tiny individual cool moments like i mentioned the way bard grabs his arrows from his quiver to the huge final shot of smog falling from the air all of it is just so cool and is representative of what this trilogy should have been rather than nostalgia soaked greatest hits my moment is just overall cooler than ruse time all right rue you now have one minute when you start talking cool is not an emotional relationship Cool is not stupidity, especially stupidity of maybe the coolest moment of Smile coming in and ripping through that town. And all of a sudden he says, oh, the weapon that might kill me. Let me stop and gloat and talk to him instead of flying over there, zigzagging and actually killing him. I don't think cool. I think that's stupid. Any type of nostalgia that comes from it is all from coolness. It's all from, wait a second, these characters that I know from the original, I've never seen them fight. They've always been old. They've always had to be the thinkers. I want to see them go at somebody. I want to see them talk shit. I want to see them do everything that's cool. And if you've never, ever seen Lord of the Rings and you come into this uh, scene and you say, oh, he looks great in that uh, in that sword and that Oh, who's this? Who's this wizard? Who's just like I? I, I don't know who any. Of, he's just like here. I'm, this is a wet day in the park. He about to wreck some shop. Oh, who are these apparitions who have cool teleporting abilities and are going down and coming up? Who are all these things that look so great and then choreographed great because it's one handed fighting, two handed fighting, and special effects all at the same time? Everything is cool about my scene. Um, all right, <laughs> two scenes from Cody's favorite movie. Uh, the Battle of the Five Armies. Interesting. Interesting. Oh, boy. Uh, are we good judges? Yeah. Okay. Um, This was interesting. <laughs> uh, I think both are good scenes. I actually like both these scenes a lot. I think they're highlights from that movie. Uh, none that I would have picked. I would have picked many from the other two films. Um, but that being said, I thought this was argued well on both sides. Um, I give the edge to Jacoby. Um, I think that Jacoby's uh, takedown of just like the... His thing at the end where he said like... 
not being a Lord of the Rings fan and looking at this as the Hobbit trilogy and stuff that's going through the Hobbit stuff. And when he was talking about how, like, it's basically just like the stunt doubles, you can tell that they're not like the actual actors fighting like bad CGI. That that worked a lot for me, and he sold me on how the smog moment is really cool. So it was it was really close, uh, but I give it to Jacoby. Uh, Cody, uh, you did that thing where you look like you vehemently disagree with me. So go ahead. I, I mean, I do. Um, it happens late in this. Usually, it happens on the first question. True, true. We've just come a long way from Jacoby with the sword and torch, um, and the <laughs> uh, fortune favors the bold. What to, did I do? Uh, you? I, not everything's about you. So you need to watch Middle Earth and bet some points. Um, but no, my thing is, uh, uh, this is about Jacoby. You could just tell, like when he got to the quiz, not a big fan or just just. And one's very passionate about it. I think he did a really good job of arguing it. Um, I'm kind of with Amaru when I watch that scene with Bard. I'm like, just fucking torch the tower. This is really over really quickly. It's really stupid. But there is that really cool moment where you see the shoot, all that stuff. I also really think, I think one of the weirdest takedowns ever is like, yeah, that's nostalgia. If you're a fan of the originals, yeah, you'll like that scene and stuff. Well, who the fuck watches The Hobbit? Like, it doesn't like, it was just weird. Like, of course, the people watching are Middle Earth fans, but that didn't weigh in my argument. I was just wanting to bring that up. Of course, they're fans. Of it. I just think Amara took it down um, throughout the the uh, fight. He just had um, just the passion for it, and I think it kind of helped. Uh, Jacoby of not being a big fan of it, but you could also see like some cracks in the armor or like chest plate where Amara could shoot the arrow. Yeah. Yeah. Or the sword stuff. or the torch. Uh, Bowman, you're deciding this one. Are we going to sudden death or are we finishing this up now? Here's the thing, right? I think both players thought their scene well. I think one of them thought the question better and that person was ripped. I think Rue did a better job of really hammering it home on cool. Yeah. Which, like, I feel like the least qualified person to judge something being cool. But <laughs> I, I think that Rue really hammered home, like, no, like, your scene's built on emotion. My scene's actually built on, like, the coolness factor of it. And Jacoby tried to defend that a little bit, but I think Rue just kept – Using the Jacoby strategy earlier, just jackhammering at home. And yeah, I, th I think Rue, once you got back into a corner with those first two questions, has really come back. Yeah, he was pissed. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Well, we are I tied up. Kirk flashbacks, and I wouldn't let that happen again. <laughs> We are tied two to two. We are going to go to a bonus question. Whoever wins this bonus question is going to win the match. So here's how the bonus round is going to work. Uh, we randomized uh, whether this question was going to come from fandom or war zone. Uh, and then I came up with a question uh, to give you guys from said uh, side of fan zone. So uh, you will have 45 seconds to open your argument. And then the following player will have 45 seconds then 30 seconds and 30 seconds for the other player whoever uh says their answer first will be going first so i'm going to say the question uh, and then i will take a pause i will repeat the question and then you will be able to start answering so whoever says first will go first if you have an answer please say it uh don't wait for somebody else if you got it just go um any questions about how sudden death is going to work yeah, I blacked I out. Sorry, during the time it's 45, 30 seconds, right? Yes. Okay. And I can, use, I can answer at any point. I don't got to wait for a certain amount of times. Sorry. I'm I'm going to say it twice, and then you and can answer. Then I can answer twice. All right. Okay. That's great. I had to, I heard the last part of the question, and and I missed the first part. Rue heard the first part, didn't hear the last part. Go to go great. I like this plan. Happy to be part of it. All right, guys. Uh, so the question is going to come from the fandom side of fan zone uh your question is going to be who should play mr fantastic in the reboot of the mcu fantastic four movie Ooh. the question again who should play mr fantastic in the fantastic four reboot in the mcu john krasinski Glenn Howerton. 
Okay. Uh, so, do I need to say who that is? Cody looks at me like I was crazy. You can if you'd like. That will. I mean, Dennis. I will do, all... I'll do my research. I'll look. Up yeah, yeah. You're good. Um, so, uh, oh, okay. so here's how this is gonna go. I'm gonna take the other judges out. I'm going to stay on screen to give you guys your 10 second warnings and whatnot. You can use your time however you would like. Um, you do not need to wait for your opponent. You can do whatever you want with your time. So, uh, Amaru, you said your answer first, so you'll be going first. You've got 45 seconds on the clock whenever you start talking. Mr. Fantastic needs three aspects to him. He needs to be a leader, he needs to be a family man, and he needs to be a nerd who has a bit of coolness with him. And John Krasinski follows all parts of that. You look at him and Chuck, and he is that nerd that you're like, he's nerdy, but you kind of kind of want to follow him. Uh, and then you see him in a quiet place, and you see the strong, silent, just their character that you want to lead and you know he is all about family and not only will John Krasinski as Mr. Fantastic be great there but you got Emily Blunt coming along so you know family is going to be there he hits every aspect that you want of of uh, of Mr. Fantastic and he has the body and the ability to to actually do any stunts you want him to do time Jacoby you have 45 seconds on the table when you start talking John Krasinski is the safe bet. He's the one everyone's been wanting for the last 15 years, where at this point it's just such a vanilla choice for a character that is going to be so vitally important to the MCU in the future. You want someone who's going to do something different than the role than all the other plain white guy, you know, leaders that, uh, that, that the MCU has introduced so far. And John Krasinski fits the mold that we've had before a different choice. Someone who's slightly different is Glenn Howerton from it's always sunny in Philadelphia. He represents all those aspects that Rue has just said about leader, uh, coolness with a bit of nerdiness, cockiness and, and a family man to it. But he also has an edge to them. And that's super important for this new iteration of Mr. Fantastic, who is going to be at the forefront of the MCU for all of its upcoming things. You need someone with a bit of with a bit of rage underneath before the surface. You need someone who looks like he's analyzing and thinking of the problems. John Krasinski looks like a wet blanket most of the time, and he's not super like smart or cool. Grant Howerton is. Rue, you have 30 seconds on the clock when you start talking. You want to talk about rage under the surface? Talk about the rage he has in a quiet place when you don't see him talking and he's saying, be quiet. You want to talk about somebody who you want to follow? Everything in that film is somebody you want to follow when he's speaking and when he's not. He doesn't have to say anything. You see it in his shows like The Office where he actually is that nerd type where in AP Bio, AP Bio, he's a teacher who doesn't look like your Glenn, doesn't look like he wants to be there. I can't see him being the nerd. As a teacher who's supposed to be the nerd, he looks like he's nonchalant and doesn't want to be there. That's not Mr. Fantastic. Prime. Jacoby, 30 seconds on the clock. You're missing the most important part of Mr. Fantastic's character is that he's supposed to look and know that he is the smartest person in any room. Smarter than Tony Stark, smarter than Doctor Strange, smarter than everybody. And John Krasinski looks like he'd seat into the background and let anybody talk. That is not the forceful, adamant face of the MCU that you need going forward. You talk about Krasinski's performances in The Quiet Place first, but we're talking about what fits best for the MCU right now. And that's a character who brings an edge to the role like Glenn Howerton does um, as, as kind of cocky, a little more arrogant for everything like that, who could do that much better than John Krasinski he could in any aspect time fuck uh okay <laughs> so <laughs> we're gonna bring in the judges uh damn um i gotta i, I gotta a second yeah can i do another 30 seconds for them no, just um, i just yeah right maybe we should start making it a minute and 45 i don't know um or the judges can enact another 30 minute <laughs> debate Okay, I, I was I was thinking of the right person, but Jacob. So. I've never watched it, Sonny. So. Oh man. Okay. 
Why did you guys want to play each other? That was really weird. That's good. We I didn't want to play it. each other first. <laughs> That's right. Tim's Sorry that the records matched up. Tim's a, Tim's a dick. We all know it. It's fine. You guys did well, okay? <laughs> oh, great. We're all good? As good as we're good to get. This is really close. Oh, God. Cody, why don't you start us off? Okay. Um... Okay, so basically, this debate was super close. Um, I will tip my hat. I did not know who Jacoby picked for the first time. I did look up. It did frame or did have that frame of reference. Brought it back. Um, I think they both painted a good picture of who they deserve. Who like what the character needs to be. I think one person painted a picture. Of and showed and gave me references of what that looks like, what it would look like as a character, and overall, um, I think the other person had to just take down the other side because I think they presented. So I went with Rue. Okay, but it was fifty-one forty-nine. It was so close. I felt so. I don't like this. Boatman, you're going. Next. Tim's an asshole. I, am, I, I think, guess. weirdly enough, both players like left things out there that they could have attacked on the other one. They made statements and really didn't. And I, I think you know neither of them really took that that low hanging fruit there. But based on the arguments that were brought up, I think Rue, like Cody said, painted the better picture. I think he really outlined those three things that you needed for. For Mr. Fantastic and Jacoby kind of played into Rue's hand a little bit and left a few things out there that uh, I think Rue said that I personally disagreed with, but I think Jacoby just kind of left them out there and didn't attack them, so I couldn't dock Rue for him. So yeah, I, I got to give the point to Rue. All right, and uh, I uh, swear to God, I mean no bias. I thought Rue did this. I w- I'm with Cody, but I did go with Jacoby. Um, I thought Jacoby's uh, pitch on the um, what you need from Mr. Fantastic that his actor would have uh, worked a lot better. Glenn Howerton would have worked a lot better for um, and his his specific point about uh, Krasinski's shown that he's a character that can kind of just like sink into the background. And that's not what you need from a Mr. Fantastic. That kind of won me over from Jacoby. But uh, my vote did not count, which means your winner is Rue Moses uh, moving on to the number one contenders match. Uh, we're going to start by talking to Jacoby first. Jacoby, really great match. You came out uh, swinging in the first two questions and won one of Rue's questions. And then uh, he just came back at the end there. But you were going, you both went hard the whole time. It was it was nuts. This is a great, great season opener. Um, how are you feeling about your performance? I uh, I feel good. Um, yeah, I felt a fire in those first few questions, and I think I fought well the most I had. Um, I thought I knew I was going with a Middle Earth question. Like I did, like I knew that that was coming. So I was like, thinking, like maybe there's a chance I could stop it before we get there. But if I, uh, I'm sad when I lose a lot and stuff, and especially when I lose to Kirk. But it's so this is the and those are the only losses that I've had before. But losing to Rue doesn't make me that sad because if there's anybody who I would want to lose to is Rue. He's a great arguer. He's fun to be around. I love the guy. Um, so it, that's that, that's that like that eases the sting a little bit as opposed to, you know, making it to the next round and losing to either like Coho or, 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 Holtzman or, or whoever's next type thing. I would, I much prefer to lose to Rue and see him go and uh, win the belt against Kirk. So I'm rooting for him uh, all the way, but this was fun, nerve wracking, exciting. I like getting back into it, so this was good. All right, Jacoby. Well, uh, this does mean you're out of title contention now, but uh, we do have a spot for you to come back post-Mayhem. If there was someone that you wanted to play after Mayhem at the Multiplex, uh, who would that be? Um, I think there's a lot of new people coming in, right? Like, I just – so, so uh, there's, people- there's a few, yeah. I would like to face someone new, someone who I, I guess who I haven't faced before, so maybe like a new name or, or anything like that just because it would be cool to see what they're – debate style is and get into the thick of things other than that you know down for whoever just not rue or kirk <laughs> <laughs> sounds good all right jacoby well we'll see you back soon maybe we'll get you back as a judge or something that'd be fun yeah, uh, thanks, so, uh see you soon uh rue you looked absolutely stunned that you you pulled out the win there i don't think you need to be stunned at all you played absolutely great 
you're going on to the number one contenders match. Uh, so how are you feeling um, about your win today against Jacoby? I want to say thank God that everybody apparently can't figure out Zachary Levi from John Krasinski because John Krasinski's not in Chuck. And I was like, I, you no, say it. I was, no, not, say it. I I was, was like, referencing when I said you left something oh. out there. I was like, Zachary, John Krasinski is yeah. not Chuck. Yeah. And that's why I just made that little like office, the office, the office. And I was like, don't say nothing. Who? Thank God. Jim um, Albert also is not a nerd by any means. Oh, oh. Uh, and then other than that, I, I was, I, I was coming in with the Twilight question. Like I, I love Twilight. I, well, I love Twilight because I used to watch it a lot. But it's been like five, six years. I was like, all right. When you came out with arguments, I didn't, I, like, I couldn't catch. I was like, damn. I was like, all right, Ocean should be fine. And then he came out. I know Ocean's up and down, and he came out with something that I was like, oh, shit, I don't really have an argument for. I did not want to happen this round that happened with Kirk where my strongest category doesn't get hit. And I was like, I cannot let that happen again. So when when I won that kill bill, when I was like, all right, sudden death, let's go. Because <laughs> I ain't losing Middle Earth. Um, and... And it wasn't stunned because I actually in 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 the sudden death I was like, this can go either way. I I don't know. So it was more relief than stun. Uh, I'm just happy about that. I'm sorry, Jacoby. You're beating yourself up in the background from for that now. And I literally was like, shit, 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 shit. But it's too late. I'm glad I pulled that out. Um, and I'm um, um, I'm glad it wasn't a repeat of of the final last year. Yeah. Well, uh, you are going to go on to play either uh, Caleb Coho or Cameron Holtzman. Cameron Holtzman debuted last season, uh, went on to play uh, Robert Parker, and I believe he played Spence uh, and Joe Farrelly as well. But you played, uh, I believe you played, yeah, you played Coho. played Caleb Coho and beat him once already. Do you want to play Caleb again? You want to play Cameron? What are you thinking? Give me Holtzman, please. I have seen Holtzman, uh, and I have practiced against him while watching, and I'm like, oh, I want him. Give me Holtzman. I want to beat up on him. Give him to me. Come on, please. Let me do this. All right. Sounds good. I'm excited. We'll see what happens. Uh, but, Rue, great job today. We'll see you in the number one contenders match. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, Boatman, let's get your final thoughts. Uh, yeah, overall, this was this was, like, a really interesting debate. I think, like... Like I said, I think Jacoby came out swinging, backed Rue into a corner, and then Rue just, like, that, he, like, Rue had, like, a Hulk moment where it was just, like, no, now you're you're going to get the 120%. And I think Rue just absolutely knocked it out of the park in those last three questions. I think that last question, there were just a few things that was, like, uh, both players kind of just left things in the air, but you know, you go by the arguments that are actually said, and I think Rue Ru won, won it by the skin of his teeth. But Tim is frozen. Sorry, I cut out. Cody, final he's back. Um, one, I want to apologize to Jacoby. Um, I said something after the second question that, man, he is in a different zone. Like, this is scary. And then three questions later, he lost the match. So I apologize. Um, I still think those first two questions were terrifying. I still think you were close on every question after that. I think if I picked three people of the top people in this league of debating, Jacoby is on that list. Um, I think Jacoby is fantastic at this game. Um, and he's super competitive, which I like. Um, so he takes takes the loss hard. Um, I hate that he has to be off until Mayhem because I think he like he could literally come back. Like, play anybody else, he continue for the belt. It just happened. You've, you basically – uh, chop Coho and Holtzman and put them in two different spots and play Jacoby and Amara. And I think you're playing this match for the number one contenders. I think that's what happens, honestly. I think they're both that good. Um, but yeah, um, Amaru playing either one of them, that's going to be interesting if Coho gives it, you know, two times the effort that he needs to. Um, he could uh, he could pull off the win. He'll just yell at Amaru a lot, and Amaru doesn't really like handle like he doesn't get faced by people screaming at him um 
Holtzman is going to be interesting because he comes prepped, but Rue says he studied the tape. So maybe I'm breaking up now. I don't know. But yeah, uh, we'll. I don't know if I froze. It looked like I froze. No, you're good. Um, but no, if Rue Rue comes prepared too, this is that's going to be a fight. But I'm ex- I want to see that matchup more than anything because he called them out. So of course I want to see the revenge match. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we will see it in about uh, you know six eight weeks time. We got some time before we get there. But uh, in two weeks, ladies and gentlemen, we have a match that has been years in the making. We have. So a debut match. We got two people coming into fan zone to wreck shop. First off, that motherfucker Mike Hanley is making his debut in fan zone debate, and he is taking on Cody Newberry in his debut in fan zone. Cody's coming to the league and he's playing Mike Hanley. And I don't know what the fuck is gonna happen. It's going to be. I'm just, just going to get him to say a bunch of cuss words. That's all I want to say. Fuck 45 billion times. And that's it. Like, that's all I want his argument to be is a giant F word. So. That's probably accurate. But we're going to see that in a couple weeks. Then we will see the Boatman and or the Boatman, the Coho and Holtzman match. Uh, so pretty soon here, you're going to get to see that number one contenders match before we get our uh, Bowman. You get to play in the next title picture. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean your name. Uh, so it's going to be very exciting. Thank you guys for watching this match. This was a great season opener. Wish every match could be like this. This was fantastic. Uh, so thank you to Boatman and Cody for uh, judging this one with me. And thank you to Jacoby and Rue for being here. We will see you guys real soon with the next match. <laughs> Thank you, Maggie, for sneezing. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everybody. Asshole! That's my bad. I was sending a tweet.